Welcome to Chemistry 51. Chapter 1 is on matter and measurements. The metric system is a system of measurements that's used all over the world, except in the United States. But it is used in the healthcare field, so it is important for you guys to learn the metric system. Um, for example, in the healthcare field, you might be given a dosage of medication to a patient in milligrams, which is metric system, or maybe you're giving them an IV with fluids and you're measuring the amount you give them in milliliters or cc's. Um, so with the metric system, one of the things I want you to know are the basic metric units for length, volume, mass, and temperature. So for length, your basic metric unit is a meter. It's abbreviated with M. For volume, it's a liter abbreviated with an L. Mass, we use the units gram, abbreviated with G, and then temperature, the basic metric unit is Celsius. I also want you to know the approximate um, size these numbers are. I have English equivalent here. You don't have to remember those exact numbers, but I do want you to know that a meter is a little bit bigger than a yard. So this gentleman here is holding a meter stick. And in our lab, you'll be measuring your height in meters. Volume, a liter is a little bit larger than a quart. So you can imagine maybe a liter bottle of water. A gram is about the mass of a paper clip. So where I have 1 28th of an ounce, it gives you an idea that's a pretty small number. You don't have to remember those numbers exactly. And then the metric unit for temperature is Celsius. Just realize that Celsius is gonna be a smaller number to the same number in the Fahrenheit scale. In the metric system, there are prefixes you can use to make your basic metric units larger and smaller. There are some prefixes here that I want you to learn. There's more prefixes in the metric system that you don't have to remember, but these are the ones I want you to know. And the thing that's nice about the metric system is they're all related by powers of 10. Versus the English system, you might say, you know, a foot is equal to 12 inches, or maybe, you know, a pound is equal to 16 ounces. The metric system, everything is related by 10, so it makes your math a lot easier. So with these prefixes, there's abbreviations you need to know. So kilo is K, and the value here means it's a thousand times bigger than your basic unit. So for example, a meter is about the size of a yardstick. A kilometer would be a thousand meters put together. It's a thousand times bigger. And you can think about maybe if you're running a race, maybe you do a 5K. Kilometers are something usually more um, comparable to miles. Deci, abbreviated with a little d, is one-tenth your basic unit. So I also put a picture of a dime here. And if you think about in a dollar, a dollar contains 10 dimes, or one-tenth of your dollar would be a dime. So that might help D and dime, D and deci, to help you remember deci means one-tenth your basic unit. Centi, abbreviated with a C, is one one-hundredth of your basic unit. So again, going back to money, you can think about if I have a dollar, a dollar contains 100 cents. Cent starts with a C or 100 pennies. Um, so there are 100 cents in a dollar. Milli, abbreviated little m, is one one thousandth of your basic unit. So I like to think of a millipede. It's this guy with all these legs, a thousand legs, but in reality he has 752. But we're going to remember a millipede has a thousand. So there's a thousand, let's say if we had a meter stick again, a thousand millimeters in a meter. Micro is a unit that's often used in microbiology. In microbiology, you look through a microscope and you're looking at microscopic organisms. The value abbreviation for micro is this um, funny looking U here, mu, that stands for one one millionth of your basic unit. Nano, this is a number we use in chemistry. Nano is very tiny, it's abbreviated with a little n. It's one one billionth, the basic unit. These are distances we would use to measure maybe the distance of an atom. Um, so they're very, very tiny. For length, 
our basic metric unit is the meter. We said a meter is a little bit more than a yardstick. Okay, so just again, remember the approximate size, and then you need to remember these metric prefixes. So 1 km is our kilometer. A kilometer contains 1,000 meters. Now, a meter contains 10 decimeters. So again, you know, you might want to think of a dime. There's 10 dimes in a dollar. One meter contains 100 centimeters. So again, you can think of there's 100 cents, you know, in our dollar, if that helps you remember. One meter contains 1,000 millimeters, and one meter contains 1 million micrometers, and then a meter contains 1 billion nanometers. Um, so again, I have a meter stick here to just kind of show you if I wanted to break it down into decimeters. We said there's 10 in here, so I could break that down maybe you know, into 10 equal parts. I don't know if that's not exactly equal, but you can imagine one-tenth of this would be one decimeter. Now my ruler up here is showing here is my decimeter, and this is going to be what your meter sticks look like that you'll be using to measure maybe your height in the laboratory. Um, so here's a decimeter and then within a decimeter we have 10 centimeters. So this area right here would represent one centimeter. Within one centimeter we have 10 millimeters. So again everything is based on our powers of 10 just to kind of show you the breakdown. So what I recommend is making maybe flashcards to remember these prefixes and doing it in this kind of format. So on one side of the flashcard, you might have a kilometer. On the other side, you would have written 1,000 meters. That's the part you need to remember. So this is really important to know these equalities. The basic units, we can switch out. Meters, we can change that maybe to grams um, or liters, but you need to also know all these prefixes. So that's one thing you wanna work on remembering that. So flashcards is a good way to do that. For volume, our basic metric unit is the liter. And again, I may ask you these equality. One liter contains 10 deciliters. One liter contains 1,000 milliliters. And then I have this one, one liter contains how many cc's? So another thing I want you to know is that one milliliter is equal to one cc. One cc, the cc stands for cubic centimeter. So what that means is if I had a cube and on each side of my cube, it measured one centimeter. Okay, so I have a length, a width, and a height. They're all one centimeter. And if I wanted to find the volume of a, my cube, I would multiply those numbers together. So one times one times one gives me one centimeter times centimeter times centimeter. I add up those together and I get a centimeter cubed. So one centimeter cubed, we just call that a cc. So this is on the syringe here. Sometimes you may say your units are milliliters. Sometimes you may say they're cc's. That means the same thing. So I do want you to know that definition as well. So if I was to ask you one liter contains how many cc's, we know if it contains a thousand milliliters, that must also be a thousand cubic centimeters. My basic metric unit for mass is the gram. And a gram, again, thinking about the size, I said it's about the size of a paper clip. This is showing you one gram of gold. So again, you can see kind of how small that is. Some mass equalities. If I said one kilogram, how many grams would that be equivalent to? That would be a thousand grams. Or if I have one gram, how many milligrams are in there? That's also 1,000. So again, remember those prefixes. What mass actually means, it's the quantity of matter of an object that it possesses. So for example, if I'm looking at this astronaut, it's the amount of him that's there. That's your mass. The terms mass and weight are usually used interchangeably here on Earth. But weight has a different definition. It's the force a mass experiences under the pull of gravity. 
So as we said, mass is how much of this astronaut I see here. So whether I'm looking at him on a TV screen and he's on Earth or if he's up on the moon, he looks like the same. That's his mass. His weight, however, is going to change based on the gravitational change when you go up to the moon. So the gravity is less at the moon, so you're going to weigh less in space if your gravity is less than the Earth. Um, so for example, let's say I have a student and on Earth they weigh 110 pounds. Now their mass when they go up to the moon um, is not going to change. That student is going to look the same, so their mass would be the same. So they would still be 110 pounds. But what's going to change is their weight. So on Earth they weigh 110 pounds, but the moon's gravity is 0.165 times the amount of the Earth's gravity. So if we multiply those two numbers out, we get a weight of 18.2 pounds. So that student weighs a lot less when they're up on the moon. And that's why those astronauts are kind of tethered to their spaceship, so they don't fly off. Now, if you were to go to Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity is much greater than the Earth's. So let's look at the student's mass. The mass, again, is not going to change. It doesn't matter what planet you go to or what moon or star, wherever you're going in space, mass isn't changed. So that's still 110 pounds. However, their gravity on Jupiter is much larger than Earth. So we're going to take 110 pounds, times it by 2.36, and this student is going to weigh 260 pounds when they're on Jupiter. So you weigh a lot more when you're on Jupiter. So do know the difference between mass and weight. When we're in the lab doing measurements, I may use those terms interchangeably. Okay, the weather person predicts the high is going to be 26 today. My question for you, is this hot or is this cold? Well, what we're missing here are the units. So it's always really important, always record your units in any measured number. So a lot of times people go through to the math, they get the correct number, but they don't put the units. The units make a huge difference. So for this one, if we have 26 degrees Celsius, okay, do we think that's hot or cold? Well, 26 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 79 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a warm day. I'd say that's a sunny day. But if I had 26 degrees Fahrenheit in our English system, that's cold because if it's 30 degree, 32 degrees or lower and it rains out, we're going to get snow. So that's a cold day. So make sure you always include those units. Okay, our basic metric unit for temperature, as we said previously, is Celsius. But I am going to ask you to be able to convert between Fahrenheit and Celsius. We have two formulas. These formulas will be given to you. The first one is if I'm looking for Fahrenheit and I'm given Celsius, I would use this formula. The one down at the bottom would be I'm given Fahrenheit and I'm looking for Celsius. That would be my question. This is showing you a comparison on our thermometer here, and this is showing water. On the Celsius scale, we have water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Um, I do want you to remember that if we were to use our formulas and convert, that'd be equivalent to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So you might be familiar with that. Um, for example, if you're a skier, I'm a skier, and I like to keep track of the weather because I like to honestly go when it's warmer. Um, but uh, you can tell I'm not an expert skier. Most people want the best weather possible, which are going to be your lower temperatures. So you might keep track of the weather. But I do want you to remember the Celsius scale for knowing the freezing point of water is zero degrees. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. That's something else I want you to remember as well. Um, on the Fahrenheit scale, that's equal to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't have to remember Fahrenheit because you can use your formulas to convert. And again, these formulas will be given. So let's do some practice with these formulas. Convert 37 degrees Celsius, which is your body, body temperature, to Fahrenheit. So in order to do this, you'll have two formulas to choose from. So on your quiz and exams, the formulas will be given there for you. And then you're just going to pick which one I want to use. So you're going to use the one where you're given the Celsius and you're looking for Fahrenheit. So that's going to be the first formula. So we have Fahrenheit is equal to 9 fifths Celsius plus 32. So all you have to do is just plug in your number. So Fahrenheit is going to be equal to 
9 fifths times 37 plus 32. And when you do your calculation, you come up with 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what you're probably heard what your body temperature is. Convert 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which is room temperature, to degrees Celsius. So again, you just pick your formula. In this case, we're given Fahrenheit, so we're going to use the formula that we're looking for Celsius, which is equal to 5 ninths parentheses Fahrenheit minus 32. So we're just going to plug in here that Celsius is equal to 5 ninths 68 minus 32. Now what you want to remember from algebra is you always are going to do your parentheses first. So that's really important to get the correct answer. So when you do your math, you end up getting 20 degrees Celsius. This slide shows three temperature scales. Our basic metric unit scale is Celsius. We learned how to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit or back from Fahrenheit to Celsius, and Fahrenheit's what we're used to. These scales show us here where water freezes, we're getting our ice cubes, the temperature water freezes at, or its freezing point, is zero degrees Celsius, or 32 Fahrenheit. And then we have water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius, or 212 Fahrenheit. You need to remember those Celsius values for um, water boiling and freezing temperatures. And then we also have our body temperature here, 98.6, on, and then our 37 on our um, Celsius scale. Now our third scale we have is Kelvin. What I want you to take note with Kelvin is we have zero K. This is the lowest temperature you can ever achieve. This is basically when molecules are no longer moving. So even if we have a solid like our ice cubes here, the molecules inside of here are still moving. The lowest temp you can possibly get to where things are not moving would be zero K. So this is in theory, we haven't actually reached that temperature, but they're working on it in cryogenics to get down to that low temperature. And so 0K is equivalent to negative 273 Celsius or negative 459.67 um, degrees Fahrenheit. So that's very cold. So we're going to be looking at Kelvin next. So the Kelvin scale is another temperature scale. It's not as widely used as the ones we're familiar with as Celsius and Fahrenheit, but we learn it here because we're going to use it in a chapter on gases, and the temperature for when we're doing our gas laws is always going to be in Kelvin. So we learn about it now, and we will be using it in the future in this class. So as I said, 0K is what we call absolute zero. That's the lowest possible temperature you can ever reach. And they're still working on getting there, but they're very close. Um, that's the lowest possible temperature is also equal to negative 273C. Um, so there's a formula. This one I do want you to know, this one will not be given to you, is Kelvin is Celsius plus 273. So for example, if I asked you to convert body temperature of 37 degrees C to Kelvin, you'd need to remember your formula and just plug in. So K is equal to 37 plus 273, so that would be equivalent to 310 K. Convert 300 degrees Fahrenheit to Kelvin. In this problem, it's going to be a two-step problem. We don't have a formula that goes directly from Fahrenheit to Kelvin. We did learn that you can go from Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius to Kelvin. So we're going to have to do a two-step problem here. So in order to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, we're going to use the formula degrees Celsius is equal to 5 ninths Fahrenheit minus 32. So then we just have to plug in Celsius is equal to 5 ninths 300.0 minus 32. And again, we want to remember always do the parentheses first. And then you'll multiply by 5 and divide by 9. Once you do that, you come up with a number of 148.89 degrees Celsius. Now, to convert from Celsius to Kelvin, we need to remember that you add 273. When I do that, I come up with a number 
422.89 Kelvin. And now when we go back and we talk about sig figs, we want our final answer to have the same amount of um, sig figs as the one with the least amount we started. So in this case, it's 300.0. So our final answer should have four sig figs. So we would have 422.9 K as my final answer.